All right, so let's uh, continue our discussion about second order systems. So we were talking about step response of second order systems where the transfer function gs is given by okay for zeta equals to 0 uh, step response is sinusoidal okay so it just uh, oscillates around 2 and 0 for zeta and 0 and 1 uh, the step response was damped sinusoid and the derivation was done in the previous class and for zeta greater than or equal to 1 uh, I'm going to talk about the step response today response is exponential <clears throat> for the case of damped sinusoid we talked about four things so rise time ts was uh, found from matlab okay so there is no closed form expression for getting the rise time so you just find it from matlab uh, we talked about peak time TP and that was given by some complicated expression pi over omega n1 minus zeta square. The percent overshoot, this is all for zeta in 0 and 1. So percent overshoot is given by one hundred e raised to negative zeta pi over square root one minus zeta square and then the settling time and I want you to correct it from the previous lecture it's four over zeta omega n So I had, uh, in, in, in the last minute hurry, I didn't put the zeta underneath the 4. So please correct it from in the, in the previous lecture, yes. Two TSs, the oh, oh, uh, this is TR, yes, thanks. Cool. This is the rise time, TR, okay, yeah. Okay, so we derived these three equations in the previous class. Uh, today I want to talk about TR1, which is another uh, sister quantity of rise time. And TR1 is defined by looking at the output, looking at the output, looking at the 10 percent, so this is the steady state value, so what do I write it as, as y infinity, this is my y infinity, that's the steady state value, so I look at 0 0.1 y infinity, I look at 0 0.9 y infinity, so 10 percent to 90 percent and TR1 is the time that it takes for the process to go from 10 percent of the steady state value to 90 percent of the steady state value, okay. This is my Y of T, this is my time T.
Okay. This is this quantity is called TR1. It is uh, similar to rise time, and it tells you how quickly your output goes from 10% of the steady state value to 90% of the steady state value. Okay. That quantity is TR1. And in the book, as well as in the handout, you will see that there is an approximation for TR1, which is given by the following expression, 2.16 zeta plus 0.6 over omega n, or 0.3 less than equal to zeta less than equal to 0 0.8 okay so this is my approx oh this is an approximation i shouldn't write it as the quality this is an approximation, not an equality. Is that 2.16 or 2 times 2.16. 2.16 uh, zeta plus 0 0.6 over omega n. Okay. Uh, yeah. Where does numbers come from? This is uh, so. Let's look at the handout, page four, page two, uh, the fourth figure in the bottom, like the second figure in the bottom, and you will see that the actual rise time has been computed. Uh, using simulation, uh, actual TR1 has been computed using simulation, and this is a linear approximation of that particular curve. Okay. Do you uh, go on page two, and then uh, the last figure. So that's the linear approximation of the TR1 time that the. Uh, so, so you compute the TR1 using uh, MATLAB or some other uh, simulation tool, and then you just do a linear approximation of TR1 in that 0 0.3 to 0 0.8 interval. Okay. Any any questions so far on this? So this is just a recap of what we did in the previous class. Yes. So I have uploaded this to Carmen already. Have you? Yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, it's, it says unable to display document because uh, not a PDF might be corrupted. So it's just like that. So. Okay, let me check. I I didn't see that uh, error. Has anyone else been able to download it from Carmen? No, no one has tried. Okay, uh, I'll I'll take a look at that and I'll uh, let you know about it. Okay. All right. Now, I have two options. First is, should we do an example, uh, applying some of these ideas to a specific numerical example, or should we continue going ahead with step response for zeta greater than or equal to 1? I'll do an audience poll, okay, and I'll do whatever democratic means we have in this class. <laughs> we use that to figure out what to do. So, the question is, do you want to do numerical example, or should we continue talking about the step response for zeta greater than or equal to 1? Example? OK, let's do that. Uh, so I have two examples today. Uh, the first is a simple RLC circuit. I want to keep this on the board. So I'm going to erase this side. This is the input voltage R L C 
and this is the V out The differential equation governing this uh, input-output relationship is Okay, so both V in and V out, they are functions of time. Uh, so what is the transfer function? V out S over V in S is, someone wants to help me? what would the transfer function look like? Let's, uh, let's derive it, okay? So this is the differential equation which you get from the physics of the components. Uh, we've derived some of these expressions in the uh, first few lectures. Uh, let's take the Laplace transform on both sides. So I have S squared, so the derivative, the Laplace transform of derivative is S times the Laplace transform. So this is two derivatives, so S squared V out of S plus R over L, S V out of S plus So what do I get? What is my G of S? Someone wants to give it a shot? Well, you always answer the question in the class, but I want someone else to answer. What would the transfer function be? Yes. Uh, one over LC over S squared plus R S plus over L plus one over LC. Cool. Okay, so I get this as the transfer function. I'm going to do pattern matching with this particular transfer function to get omega n square, the natural frequency as 1 over LC, which comes from this term in the denominator, and then 2 zeta omega n is equal to R over L, which comes from the coefficient of S in the denominator. Okay. And in this case, it so happens that the numerator is also equal to omega n square. So that's great because it falls exactly in that format. Um, and so I know the natural frequency and I know the two zeta omega n. So maybe I can compute zeta from here. What is zeta going to be? That's r over l. Two L omega n and omega n is square root of one over L C what is this equal to? I think it's C by L, yeah. 
Okay, so that's the damping coefficient. So by picking, so if I want to create an uh, RLC circuit with a specific input-output specification with respect to zeta and omega n, I have three parameters to play with. I can play with the inductor, I can play with the capacitor, I can play with the resistor to get the precise value of zeta I want and the precise value of omega n I want, okay, for this particular problem, yes. So this is R over L. I want to compute zeta. So I have to put two omega n in the denominator and then omega n is equal to square root of one over LC. So if I multiply it here, the L, yeah, so there is some cancellation and then you get square root of C over L. Okay. So this is the application of second order system to an RLC circuit. Now, what is important to note is that if your V out was across L or across R, then the equations are going to be completely different and the transfer function is going to be different. But it will still be a second order transfer function, okay? So the denominator will be of order two, but the numerator could have a zero or may not have a zero depending upon which of the two terminals you are actually measuring. Okay, now let's apply, let's do another numerical example. So this one was of course uh, showing you how RLC circuit fits within the framework of second order system. Uh, oh, the other thing is now if you give it an input, a step input of let's say one volt or something, uh, you will see oscillations in the output of the capacitor. Uh, if you look at the potential difference across the capacitor, it's going to go through up and it's going to go through that sinusoidal wave and then eventually it will uh, converse to some steady state value. Anyone knows what that steady state value is going to be? So if I turn on this circuit and I give it an input of five volt or 10 volt, let's say, what is the V out going to be in steady state? Yes. It'll be going to, yeah, it's going to be V and Y. Uh, because the capacitor will act as an open circuit, the inductor will act as a short circuit. Right, yeah, and so the DC gain, or in this particular case, the output will converge, ex will become exactly equal to V in asymptotically. So in the limit, your V out is going to be equal to V in, and that's precisely what the uh, step response of this transfer function looks like. Okay, so, so from the physics, I, I'm assuming all of you would remember that if you give it a DC current, uh, which is a unit step input, so that's a DC current. If you give it a DC uh, voltage source, event, initially there will be some amount of uh, charging and discharging, and then after that, in the limit, this capacitor will act as an open circuit, and then V out is going to be exactly equal to V in, okay, with no difference in the potential difference across uh, these two terminals. Uh, now, how do I see it from this transfer function? So, I can apply the uh, final value theorem for Y of S, so let's do that. So, let me write it uh, concretely. So, from physics, slash, uh, I don't know which other class you might have taken, so circuits class, we know that V out will be equal to V in as T goes to infinity. But let's try to see it from the control system's perspective. So I have Y of S equals to G of S 
into u of s that's equal to 1 over s multiplied by omega n square over s square plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n square. Okay, I want to find y infinity. I want to fi find v out infinity is equal to y infinity. That's the steady state output. So I'm going to apply final value theorem. Anyone remembers what final value theorem is? limit of s goes to 0, s times y of s, right. Uh, so that's limit s goes to 0, s into 1 over s into omega n square over OK. What's this limit equal to? I'll pause here for a bit. So this S gets canceled. 1, omega n square over omega n square is equal to 1. Oh, so this is for a unit step input. Let me. Uh, let me write it as Vn, uh, whatever is the input voltage. And then I'll have Vn here. And then I'll have Vn here. And so I'll have the Vn as the y infinity. OK, so that's the proof using final value theorem. which says that Vn is going to be equal to V out. Uh, rather, V out is going to be equal to Vn as t goes to infinity. OK. OK, so quick recap. We have an RLC circuit. I can use the physics to figure out what the input-output equation is uh, for the V out versus V in. I do the Laplace transform. And for a given input, V in, I want to know what V out is going to look like asymptotically. So I compute the Laplace transform of the output using the usual transfer function multiplied by the input Laplace transform. And then I apply final value theorem to conclude what we already know from physics of this particular circuit. <clears throat> now the next example, numerical example I have is a control system design for a second order system. So let's uh, look at that particular example. So I have yes. Um, why are you writing it out as a generic form of the second order transfer function as opposed to a specific one to the RLC circuit? Well, it doesn't matter. It's the same same thing. Uh, now, if I had uh, what I'm saying, well, you know, so this is the input-output relationship when you are looking at the output terminal of the capacitor, right? If you're looking at the output across inductor or across resistor, that value is going to be different, right? Now, that would change the transfer function, and then I'll use that particular transfer function here. But for this particular circuit, 
whether I use this transfer function or whether I use this generic, it doesn't matter because omega n square is equal to 1 over LC and 2 zeta omega n is equal to R over L. So the equations are the same. There's no difference. Okay, so here I have K over S, S plus P, Y of S. Okay, so this is my feedback system. I have been asked to design K and P by picking appropriate component, I can influence K and P. And the specification that's been given to me is that percent overshoot has to be less than or equal to 5%. And the specification for settling time is that it has to be less than four seconds. So the question is find K and P. Okay. So what should be my first step in order to solve this problem? Find the transfer function. Find the transfer function from RS to YS, so let's, oh, I didn't want to delete it. Okay, so anyone remembers what the transfer function of this system is? So let's call this G. No, G is already used. Let's call it T. T over one plus T. So the transfer function Ys over Rs is Ts over 1 plus Ts. Okay? This is something we have derived several times in the class, so I'm not going to derive this expression, but this is what the transfer function of this feedback system is. Uh, let's expand this. Oh. I'm using T both for time and transfer function. Hopefully you won't get confused between this T and this T, okay? These are two, this is the transfer function and this is the settling time. How long is H? H, yeah, actually I can use H. That's a good idea. H. H, okay, so now there is no confusion. All right, so HS over one plus HS, so let's do that. K over S, S plus P over K one plus S, S plus P. What should the denominator be? S square plus PS plus K. Okay, so this is step one. So step one was find the transfer function. What would the, so I need, I, I need to figure out P and K such that these two conditions are satisfied, okay? So what should the step two be? Oh. 
okay refer to the handout uh, all right so all of you have page number two open uh, I'm assuming everyone has the handout okay so let's look at the third figure on page number two in order to have maximum overshoot percent overshoot less than five percent what should the value of zeta be zero point seven how many of you agree with him okay many people yeah you are right uh, Okay, so zeta has to be greater than or equals to 0 0.7 uh, because if you look at the curve after 0 0.7, the percent maximum percent overshoot is actually going to go down. So I can pick any zeta greater than 0 0.7 and I'll be fine. Now settling time less than or equal to 4 seconds. So what is Ts equal to? 4 over, oh, it's right here, 4 over zeta omega n, I want this to be less than or equal to 4. What does that imply? Zeta omega n is greater than or equal to 1. Yes. So does this graph apply to all second order systems? All second order systems with with that transfer function. Yeah. If you have an additional pole or an additional zero, then of course you can't use these expressions. Okay. All right, so everyone agrees that my zeta has to be greater than 0 0.7 and my zeta omega n has to be greater than or equal to 1. Uh, let me just pick, so p is supposed to be 2 zeta omega n. So let me just pick p equals to 2 and then omega n equals to what should my omega n be? Greater than 1 over zeta. So let me pick zeta equals to 0 0.7. Then my omega n has to be 1 over zeta, which is equal to uh, what is 1 over 0 0.7? may square root of 2. Uh, let me pick zeta equals to square root of 2. No, 1 over square root of 2, which is roughly equals to 0 0.707. Okay, so my k should also be equal to, k should be equal to omega n square, which is equal to 2. Okay, so if I pick p equals to 2 and k equals to 2, I'm going to meet all the specifications for this control system. Yes? Um, how, do you, or like, how do you choose to pick t equals to k? Oh, so I can pick any value of zeta and omega and such that this product is greater than or equal to 1 and this is greater than or equal to 0 0.7. So if those two conditions are satisfied, I'm going to meet these two specifications, okay? Now, I am free to pick, so I'm gonna pick zeta omega n equals to one because it's greater than or equal to one. So that gives me the value of p equals to two. And I'm gonna pick zeta equals to one over square root of two, which is approximately 0 0.707, so that's greater than 0 0.7, in which case my omega n is equal to square root of 2 based on this, this expression and that gives me the value of k equals to 2, okay?
Now you can pick any value of k and any value of p as long as these two conditions are satisfied. Okay. From a control designer's perspective, this is a very benign situation where you don't have to make any trade-offs. Whatever specification is given to you, you can always find millions of values of k and p such that that specification will be satisfied. But in real systems, you always have to make trade-offs. So the situation will not be that simple. Uh, but in this case, it is. Uh, and we have a large number of values of k and p for which the specifications will be satisfied for the closed loop system. Any questions on this example? So if you get such a question in the exam, doesn't mean it's going to come, but if you get such a question in the exam, step one is always find the closed loop transfer function. Step two is to look at these specifications and identify what the value of zeta and what the value of k, uh, well, omega n you need in order to satisfy the uh, specifications. And then this would be your step three, where you pick an appropriate value and then figure out what k and p and whatever other values you need to find out should be equal to. Okay? We'll do more such examples in the next, in the subsequent classes, but this is just one simple example to show you what are the three steps to success, to do well in exam. Well, not just exam, but in life, because these are the three steps you will have to always take if you're doing control system design. Okay, questions? Yes? Are omega n and zeta, are those always controllable in all systems by the creator? No, not really, okay? So you'll only have control over some complex combination of zeta and omega n, but not necessarily individual components, okay? In the case of RLC circuit, it was somewhat easier because you could control three components, but if you assume that the inductor, for instance, is given because it's some physical system, then you only have control over the R and C. Let's say the R is also given, then you only have control over C, which you can pick, and then you, are, you cannot meet all the specifications that might be provided by someone else. Okay. That's a good question. So any other question? All right. So let's go back to doing theory, uh, more theory, which is what I love. Uh, so let's figure out what the response going, what the response is going to be. The step response for zeta equals to one is going to be. And there is a very cool thing that happens when zeta is greater than or equal to one, which is something you have seen already. So zeta equals to one, your uh, Gs is omega n square over s plus omega n square. So your step response omega n square over s s plus omega n square. Okay, now if I look at the step response, I do the inverse Laplace transform, so partial fraction plus inverse Laplace transform would mean, would, would give you the value of yt, which is equal to 1 minus e raised to omega nt minus omega nt e raised to minus omega nt.
this is of course true for t greater than or equal to 0. So what's the funny thing here in the response, step response? What's the difference between this step response and the response for the case where zeta was less than 1? You have an answer? I mean, there's no oscillations. There are no oscillations, right? We don't have any sine waves, no cos waves, no theta, nothing. Uh, it's just one minus an exponential signal minus another exponential signal, okay? Uh, what's the other salient feature? Let's uh, try to dissect this equation uh, more carefully. So this is one, which is great. This is a positive number with a negative sign. This is another positive number with the negative sign, which means y of t is always less than or equal to 1. Well, actually, it's strictly less than 1, okay? So no matter at which point of time you see, there is not going to be any overshoot in the system whatsoever, okay? So let's try to see this uh, more carefully. If, t wa if, if zeta was less than 1, there, are, there is a percent overshoot, there is settling time, there is peak time, there is rise time, and the, you are going to see oscillations in the output. As soon as you take zeta equals to 1, which is this case, no oscillations, absolutely no oscillations, and the output will not have any overshoot whatsoever because the output is always going to be less than 1. In fact, if you again refer to the handout and look at the step response on page one for the case where zeta is equal to one, you will notice that it exponentially converges to one, which is the steady state output, and it doesn't have any overshoot whatsoever, okay? Uh, this kind of thing is known as bifurcation in control system where you see a qualitative change in the response of the system if you move a parameter just by a little bit, okay? So going from zeta equals to less than, going from zeta less than one to zeta greater than one is a very small change in zeta. But if you look at the response, there is a significant difference in the response of the system, and that's known as bifurcation. Uh, bifurcation theory is a very well-studied topic in control systems, and uh, I don't know if any of you go for graduate studies and you take nonlinear systems, you will have a very close encounter with bifurcation theory. So this is one such instance where the response of the system changes drastically if you move a parameter just by, I mean, if you change the parameter just by a little bit. For zeta greater than one, you get a similar response. It's just that the equations are more complicated, so I'm not going to write it, but you have two exponential terms. You have one minus exponential term minus another exponential term with appropriate coefficients, okay? And for zeta equals to two, again, the response is shown in the handout, and you see that the response is very sluggish. It doesn't go to the steady state as quickly as you would like it to be. Uh, but if you look at the case where zeta is less than one, it gets to the steady state value pretty quickly. So that's just the trade-off you need to make um, in your system. Okay, any, any questions about that? So I just want to write it here, zeta greater than one uh, is also one minus e raised to something something, well, one minus So the response y of t 
is given by a complicated expression which, which also looks very similar to this expression. Questions? Okay. So, yeah. Um, should there be a negative sign in front of the omega n in the second term? Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, minus omega n. It has to decay. The, the exponential term has to decay as t goes to infinity. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. Um, so this is, uh, so I don't have much time, so I'm going to introduce what we are going to study in the next class. So this is, of course, a second order system. In the next class, we are going to add a pole in this second order system to make it a third order system. And we are going to add a zero in the numerator. And then we are going to see how the response of the system changes once you add a zero or a pole to this second order system. And we are going to show uh, that under certain conditions, Adding a pole will not necessarily affect the response of the system a lot, and therefore you can just ignore that pole completely. Or adding a zero to the system will not necessarily change the response, and therefore you can ignore that zero completely. So we are going to study that. We are going to look at that particular problem in the next class, and then we'll do some examples, numerical examples. So thank you all. Have a good weekend.